All right, so we are at our lunch break. Um, we go inside today and uh, Judge Gloria Navarro is having an identity crisis. She can't tell if she's a judge or an additional prosecutor. Um, she flip-flops this entire trial, um, trying to be unbiased, but really pushing for the prosecution. At times, she seems like the fourth prosecutor in, in this uh, courtroom today. Could it be the fact that her husband is a prosecutor? Um, could it be a fact that she's appointed by Harry Reid, the person who has orchestrated this event on the Bundys and the political prisoners? Um, we're not sure, but you can definitely tell that she's fighting her identity crisis inside as she pulls back and forth with trying to be unbiased and being a full-on prosecutor um, from the bench. Uh, we've had her ask multiple questions on the inside always to figure out and help elaborate on the prosecution's points and getting their points across to the jury. Um, I will go to hand it over to Anthony about what happened as we walked in the courtroom this morning. So we walked into the courtroom this morning and the first item of business was something outside of the presence of the jury and it was the lead prosecutor Steve Myrie stands up and says we have an issue with something that was said the day before. And the day before a U.S. Forest Service employee with the last name Shilly uh, gave his testimony and his testimony is that he pulled over after the bridge he got out and he started taking pictures and at some point during the jury follow-up uh, they were asked a question uh, Shelley was asked if he had any fear and he said well yes I had fear uh, it was Richard Tanasi a representation for Stephen Stewart who uh, cross-examined him and said well what what exactly were you scared of because when you got to the bridge everybody was standing up uh, you took a picture of some BLM agents down in the wash and then you turned and panned back around and now there are people laying on this bridge. So what exactly were you scared of? And he made the statement at the end, alluded to the fact that maybe he was scared of the fact that the government was pointing weapons at him. Maybe, maybe that's what he was scared of. And of course there was an objection. Uh, there was a juror that had to leave early, uh, another counsel had to get out of the courtroom quickly, so it was brought up this morning. And Steve Myrie says, we think that what Richard Tanasi did was a direct contravention to a court order determined before the proceedings that the behavior of the federal government cannot be used as evidence uh, in the case. And he's saying that what Tanasi said was in direct contravention to that court order, that it was calculated, it was, uh, it was malicious, and that he wanted to enact sanctions. Uh, Tanasi got a, an opportunity to defend his line of questioning, which he did just fine. Uh, and one of the sanctions, he said, uh, Steve Myrie says, we're not going to ask for a mistrial, uh, but we would like, as a potential sanction that we're contemplating, is to ask the court to allow us to review uh, defendants' closing arguments before they're given. Uh, so now you've got the government charging men with a litany of crimes, uh, saying that the behavior of the federal government is completely irrelevant in the case. You can't speak to your state of mind because it's a veiled attempt at jury nullification. And before you explain to the jury in your closing arguments to wrap everything up and why they should acquit you of these charges, uh, by the way, the government needs to take a look at that first and make sure that it's not in contravention to some court order. Uh, it's absolutely unheard of. We asked one of the attorneys uh, during a break, at any, at any point in your career, has the government ever asked to review your closing statement? Um, I can't repeat everything he said, but basically, no. No, it's never happened. All right, so we go into the cross-examination of Shannon Serena, um, and we're with Leventhal, the last person to cross-examine him. He brings up the fact that he said BDU, guys, um, in BDU in the back of the truck. He asked him to explain what BDU meant, meant battle-ready uniforms. Then he shows a picture of the men at the stage and says, well, would this be considered BDU? And he says, yes, and they're in full camo, head to toe, um, which we know the people in the back of that truck were not. Then he brings up the fact that as he's going with his lights and sirens, that truck actually pulls aside, not trying to uh, trying to make way for this officer. Um, he said after the briefing, he went to the wash believing there was officers being held at gunpoint. But the truck got there after he did. He's seen the truck pulls over, he goes by the truck. So that truck full of people, which has all the defendants in the courtroom in that truck, uh, actually arrived to the scene after this officer. He was also asked if his camera in his vehicle was rolling the entire time. 
he said he thought it was, but they chose to show mostly Madsen's dash cam and not his. He said that his has a mic, so that if he was talking to a driver, it would pick up the conversation on his dash cam. Um, then he goes in, Leventhal tries to bring another piece of evidence as a part of his dash cam. The judge makes Leventhal jump hoops, asking question over and over, playing the whole entirety of the video for him, um, this, that, and the other thing to get him to enter this. Then the government objects to the relevance because the tape is after the BLM has already left. They had an objection, they went to a sidebar, and we were actually overruled and, and got to bring this piece of evidence, only from seven minutes to eight minutes. So they play the video, a man with a long gun walks up, he says, thank you. The guy, Serena, goes over to his uh, vehicle and, sa and says on the radio, everything down here is peaceful. Everyone is happy, all is good. The government then gets up for recross and says, of course at that time, everyone is good. The people with guns already got what they wanted. Tensions have already lowered. So what the defense did by asking about fear is against a court order, but the government can get up and say, well, of course it is because all the people with guns already got what they wanted. Um, and that his mission was to keep the peace. Also that reports, um, the purpose of a report is for a general overview trying to say, well, if some pertinent information doesn't make it into the report, well, it's just a general overview. Then we go into the jury questions. A lot of the jury questions were um, similar. He had very long-winded answers, and all of his answers were very contradictory. He kept going back and forth on different topics, and it was, um, uh, to me, it was confusing. I'm sure it confused the jury and probably uh, discredited himself a little. So I'm just going to quickly read through them. Do you or anyone controlling traffic ever stop traffic fully? He said yes for one minute. They stopped traffic fully to help the protesters cross the road to watch the cattle go home. That was the only time it was ever stopped um, fully. If your higher op officers knew there were people being held at gunpoint, why did they not send reinforcements? He said he was the re reinforcement. At what time were you informed the officers were being held at gunpoint? He says he does not know, but sometime before his dash cam came on when he was back at the uh, the, the shop when they left. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. To your knowledge, was that statement accurate when you arrived? He said he did not see that when he arrived. His first um, task was to get traffic moving again. Um, he didn't want to see people getting stuck in traffic. Um, did you observe anyone pointing guns from the wash, aiming guns at the bridge? No. Did you see anyone from aiming wa uh, guns at the BLM from the wash, not from the bridge? No. At any time were guns on the bridge pointed at you or your other officers? No. Of course, they're long-winded answers. I'm making this short for this. At any time were people with guns asked about their guns or the purpose or intent of carrying those guns? He said no tensions were high and they already fully knew why the, the people had their guns. Are citizens allowed to open carry in public? The judge answers this one. It goes to a legal standing, but I can guarantee you this case is not about that. None of these defendants are charged with merely open carrying in public. When you initially encountered the men with the long guns, did you assess the situation? He said yes, and his assessment was that they could be in danger at any time. Did you relay that to the supervisor? No, there was no uh, comms. They couldn't get that through. Uh, another question, did you know um, anyone, any, another organization that was there that would wear military clothing? He said no, I don't think he understood that. I'm sure they were talking about like the Oath Keepers or militia. He did say militia often wear that, but I know he, he wasn't picking out a specific organization. Was there a plan to clear the unarmed people out of the area that day? The plan was to release the cattle and that the people would leave on their own after the cattle were released. Did you see the defendants holding any BLM at gunpoint? The answer was no. Were you armed? The answer was yes. The men who approached you, were they hostile or aggressive towards you? No, they were stern, but not hostile or aggressive. He, could t he said at one point he couldn't tell the good guys from the bad guys. He felt like saying, hey, could we do shirts versus skin so he could tell the good guys versus the bad guys. We all know what side the BLM would have been on on that day, um, but he's trying to misconstrue that to the jury. Did they threaten you in any way? No. What did they say to you? Uh, that called for hearsay and she wouldn't let him answer. Did you see any of the defendants 
block the road with a truck. No. Um, but he said it did say people with guns were blocking traffic. If you were responding to officers in danger, why was your demeanor so calm and laid back? He goes to say that it, his demeanor was based on, you know, the people who treat him with uh, respect get treated with respect back. If they're nice, he's pleasant. Um, that his demeanor was that way so that he didn't escalate the situation. You testified people with armed assault rifles. Uh, what makes a gun an assault rifle? He says the amount of ammo it can hold and the fact that it can shoot rapidly. Is there a prob uh, is there a prohibition against owning an assault rifle in Nevada? Once again, the judge says that this is not what the trial is about. This is not what they're charged on. Is it unusual for people to be wearing BDU um, on Saturdays in Vegas? He said he said one or two. That's not unusual. In mass like this, it is. You indicated you were fearful. Um, where is the bias for this fear? Have you ever been in a situation like this? He said he was afraid he was going to be shot and killed. Have you ever been involved with a civilian volatile situation? He said yes, but would you give an exact um, description of that? You indicated that dispatch had told you that officers were being held at gunpoint. Did they raise the fear level? Um, he, he stated, he talked about his fear level when he got there, that it was continually going up. He, at this point, he said, we had civilians being stopped at gunpoint who really just wanted out of there. And, and so he's turned this for now, his main point wasn't just traffic, but these civilians were being stopped in their vehicles at gunpoint, and they needed to get out of there. And so that was his main concern, is to get those civilians out of there. Uh, uh, we've seen lots of video footage. There's a million, there's many, millions of pictures, uh, lots of video footage. Nowhere have I ever seen anyone get stopped at gunpoint. There was a lot of jury questions. Did you tell dispatch that the issue was not that when you got on the ground? He said no. And then it was asked, who was the incident commander? Captain Jackson was the incident commander of the Nevada Highway Patrol. Once again, if you're calling on Serena, his captain the day of was Captain Jackson. I'm not sure if that helped any. Duties changed to support officers being held at gunpoint. Were you checking in on that situation after you got there? He said no. Did Mr. Serena personally see any weapons being pointed at the BLM? He said he saw um, guns being pointed over the barrier, but he could not see the BLM from where he was at on the bridge. This is important information. He says he was on the bridge and he couldn't even see the BLM. Um, you said you responded to a call to assist LEOs being held at gunpoint. Um, what they had superior gunfire and he was in a shock and awe situation. <coughs> He tried, 57, when you, have you have been trained to de-escalate de the situation? He goes back to the same answer about his demeanor and that that's part of it. Perez then gets up for another cross question. From your vantage point, you never saw the BLM from the North Brown Bridge. Could you see under the South Brown Bridge? He, his answer was no, he couldn't see that. Um, then the government calls Ranger Alexander Burke. She is going on and testifying that she saw Ricky and uh, Todd Engel point weapons at her. She took pictures of them from her phone through her binoculars. Then she is stating that she saw Eric Parker point weapons at her. Now, mind you, she is between post one and the gate under the southbound bridge. She is to, uh, that would be a diagonal from the bridge that would almost be invisible from the bridge. <coughs> and she's stating it's the same spot Shalakis was in the Shalakis videos. And she's saying that she could see, she has identified so far Todd Engel, Ricky Loveland, and Eric Parker. She had pictures of Todd Engel and Eric Parker, but she did not, or Todd Engel and Ricky Loveland, but did not have a picture of Eric Parker. Um, and she has been very emotional during her testimony. She said she got to that position to take cover. Um, she testifies that she deals with people with weapons on a daily basis. So um, we'll have to get back in there. She also testified when she saw Ricky and Todd that they uh, were there without Nevada Highway Patrol, but we just know after Serena that they weren't there until after Nevada Highway Patrol was there. So she's already caught in a lie immediately. We'll have to see if they can bring that up and uh, perjure her with that. So and you should specify the pictures don't show any pointing of weapons. Oh yeah, and the pictures themselves do not show pointing of weapons of any type. It just shows people on the bridge. 
In fact, they're from a, through binoculars, from a phone through binoculars at a long distance. She stated she w did not have good uh, firepower to shoot from that position in a very tearful state and that she didn't have long range weapon expertise. I'm pretty sure that they didn't have long range uh, weapons that could reach them from where they were at either. So we'll see where this goes. She is still in direct uh, examination when we go back after lunch. Um, another thing I wanted to bring up is, is here what we have here is the government is, is charging you with thought crimes. They are charging you with a crime they believe could have been committed. They are not charging with actual crimes. Um, there is no victim here, so there is no crime. Um, they're arrested two years after the fact. Um, they're bringing in tearful people, you know, that are totally new from the last trial. They're bringing all of this evidence in. We had the aerial gentleman bring in his evidence and then say, well, he couldn't see that when he was filming it. He was only shown that by the FBI afterwards. So what we have here is worse than the Minority Report movie. Like, what we live in today, it's a facade. This court system, this court here in the federal system is a joke. It's a play, it's, it's a production for uh, we the people, and um, if we don't stand up and do something about this, what are you gonna be charged with for thinking about next? So remember, no victim, no crime. Um, let's push back on these people. Oh, wait a minute, wait. Uh, speaking of which, going back to Alexandra Burke, uh, the bulk of her testimony is that people pointed weapons at her. They pointed weapons, pointed weapons. From her vantage point, from a very long distance, people pointed weapons, and finally she was asked to clarify that and they said, what was the threat? The threat was guys with guns. That was all she said. The threat that day to her was guys with guns. And when she was pressed about it, uh, she pointed out that, well, the weapon that was pointed at her, it was in the low ready position. There was a weapon low ready, and that that is what was pointed at her. And that was for Ricky and Todd. She comes back and now she's saying that Eric, affirmatively in what she calls a high ready position, has over a concrete barrier pointed the weapon at her. Now granted, from where anybody on the northbound bridge would be standing looking at the wash, that would be at about a 45 degree angle to the left of where this lady was. She's saying that these people stood up over a barrier, pointed a weapon at her, and then panned and scanned for other targets. It's, it's absurd. There's no, there's no video or photographic evidence to support any of this, but she's crying, she's emotional, and she's scared of guys with guns. Your Second Amendment is being criminalized, and I think people think maybe we embellish it. Um, my encouragement would be to get off your ass and come down here and see it for yourself because it's really serious.